Well, thank you, music team, and thank you, uh, Don, for that uh, wonderful special music here this morning. Really uh, uh, great song and uh, well done. So we appreciate that as we prepare our hearts um, to open God's Word here this morning. And uh, today we'll be uh, deviating a little bit from our topic as we've been going through the book of Mark because we have uh, Brother Andy Patton who will be preaching the Word of God this morning to us. Uh, Andy and Carol have been missionaries for a long time in the country of Peru. And if you were here for the ABF, you saw all those wonderful slides. And there's definitely a theme to this morning, and it's a great theme. And the theme is encouragement, as Andy will be bringing a message uh, that really um, uh, pulls together for us the importance of encouraging each other. And I say that it's a theme because looking at all of those slides and seeing all of the things that are being done down there in Peru and, and just the ministry opportunities and the, the broad uh, scope of it all, I find to be very, very encouraging. So it is a blessing to uh, have the patents here uh, this summer and to be able to allow them to, to just be a part uh, is just a, a real blessing for us. Uh, they're hardworking people. They've been up there at the rescue mission. Uh, Charlie and, and Kylie were huge helps to us uh, this past week uh, for the UW Sports Ministry. Can't say enough about them. And just excited that uh, Brother Andy can come this morning and bring us the Word of God. So come along. Good morning. That's right. I'm in control now. <laughs> I didn't realize it, but I'm in control. Uh, before I give you my message, I wanted to introduce you to our family. As the pastor said, we're, we're from Faith Community Church. We're members here. And a long time ago, back, I think this picture was taken in 2003, was when we started working on going to the mission field. Um, but I wanted to tell you that we're missionaries to the upper Amazon area of Peru, the city of Iquitos, um, which is surrounded by water. Uh, it has between 600,000, 700,000 people. And the only way to get there is by air or by water. This is what our family looks now, look like now. Uh, that was a couple years ago, but uh, only our oldest daughter is not in that picture. We have Linda and Katie and Allison and Kylie and Charlie and myself. I'm the serious one in the middle. And then Carol. And recently, our second oldest daughter, Allison, was married to Josh Cunningham. And we were all able to be at the wedding. So I'll use these wedding pictures to introduce to you each one of our family members. Our oldest daughter is Emily. She was living in Texas and San Antonio, but now is going to be living in Ohio. And it was really great to see her at Allison's wedding. Kylie is here with us, and uh, she graduated from Liberty, as did Allison, by the way. I forgot to mention that she graduated the day before her wedding. That was exciting. Um, Kylie graduated from Liberty. She's here with us. Uh, pray for her because she has some eye issues that she has to be have taken care of this next week and um, then she needs to see what the Lord would have her do next. Then we have Katie. Katie's working at a camp in Ohio this summer and then she'll return to Liberty University for her senior year. Then Linda is living and working in Lynchburg, and she'll return in the fall for her junior year at Liberty University. Then we have Charlie, uh, who's here with us. Charlie is basically finished with high school. Uh, he came with us from Peru, and now he's here, and, and just pray that God will make it clear what the next step is for him, whether he should study or work or both. Uh, we're not, he's not sure yet. But um, then we have two grandsons. We have Weston. This is a little bit dated, not real dated. We have Weston and we have Ian. And this picture is a little old also. And that's our family. This is my cheat sheet in case I forgot my kids' names. 
First <laughs> Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Let's pray. Let's ask for the Lord's help this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of those that are present here this morning. I ask, Lord, that you would help me speak with clarity and with passion, and I ask that your Holy Spirit will enable me to communicate what you've laid on my heart to share with the folks here this morning, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to them. May you be glorified, and may people be edified this morning, and and we'll ask you, and we'll thank you in your son's precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Steve Bond asked me to give him a a title for my message, so I said, well, encourage one another. But the truth of it is that we can have an alternate title, and it would be, are you a parakeet, a buzzard, or a goose? And we'll get to that later. You'll see why that could be the title of the message. But believe me, everybody, This message is just as much for me as it is for you, all that are out there. This is the first message that I've given in a long time in English. So, you know, (laughs) pray for me. But this message, this message is for me. Um, I needed this. Um, We're talking about encouragement, and we'll look in the Old Testament. David, an example of encouragement in the Old Testament Um, we're going to be looking at a part of 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. But I want to set the stage for you before we actually start reading that, 1 Samuel 30, 1 to 6. Um, David had, uh, he got himself a buddy amongst the Philistines. You know, the Philistines, you know, from Goliath that David had killed, yeah, he, he, he started having friends among the Philistines, and he started hanging out with them. And, and then his, he had a friend, Achish. Sounds kind of like a pain, doesn't it? Achish. And Achish was like, hey, David, you know, we're going to go and fight against the Israelites, and we know you don't like them too much right now, so why don't you come with us? Why don't you run with us? So David got his guys, and he said, yeah, let's do that. So so he joins them, and <clears throat> he's coming kind of in the back there, and they get to a place where they're getting ready to, to go into battle, and then all of a sudden, some of the Philistine leaders, they're looking over there, and they're like, hey, Akish, who's that guy over there? Oh, that's, that's David. That's my friend David. Wait a minute. Isn't he the guy that they wrote that hit song about? Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Yeah, that, that's him, but that was then. This is now. He's okay. He's good. And, but they were like, no, I don't know. You know, he could, he could get some serious street creds if he turned on us at the last minute and, and he killed us, and then he could get in good with the Israelites and maybe they'll take him back. So, no, we don't trust him, man. You need to tell your friend to go home before he gets on our last nerve. And so... So Achish was like, David, man, you're, you're going to have to go. So David, he packs up with his guys, and uh, they go back home. Well, back home then was Ziklag. So now let's pick up the story, 1 Samuel 30, 1 to 6. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire, and they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. 
But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Can you imagine how he felt? First of all, if we read more of the story, he never inquired of the Lord whether he should be hanging out with the Philistines and should be, you know, going up against Israel. So he didn't really ask the Lord's advice. Then he goes, uh, leaving everybody behind. They come back and they find out that everything's gone. Everybody's gone. They've all been taken. I don't know if he knew the fact that it says here that none of them were killed. He might not have known that. And on top of that, everyone else is blaming him. You really messed up. You know, it's your fault. So he has his own grief to deal with, and then he has the, the criticism of the other people. But, it, you know, we all need encouragement from time to time, and all of us at some time or another, we're going to face a crisis when everything seems to fall apart. There are times of discouragement when things go wrong, even when we're trying to do things right. And sometimes people will even say, you know, that's what you get for trying to do things right. There are times of uncertainty where you don't know how things are going to turn out. There are times of stress when the load just seems too heavy. You know, we can't bear it anymore. We can't handle it. There are times of fear when even our sense of security finds itself threatened. But in all those situations, we need encouragement in the Lord. David strengthened himself in the Lord. It's also possible for others to strengthen us, which we'll talk a lot more about later. You know, that's what Jonathan did a little bit earlier when he visited David. Jonathan was one of David's friends. I read here in 1 Samuel 23, it says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horish and encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul my father will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul my father knows that also. So therefore, to strengthen ourselves in God means that we remind ourselves of what scripture says about God and his promises. And then we apply those truths to our current situation. And strengthening ourselves in the Lord, it's an intentional act. It just doesn't just happen. And when it says David strengthened himself, the Hebrew verb implies persistent and continuous effort. Sometimes we almost have to grab ourselves by the collar and, and give our Selves a stern talking to. That's what the psalmist did in Psalm 43, 5. It says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. If we had time to read the whole story, we might come away with three principles that could guide us in strengthening ourselves in the Lord. One, we need to always seek direction and guidance from God. That should be a resource that we always use. Another is, you know, where the Lord leads, when he's the one doing the leading, he provides. That's a truth that we need to acknowledge. And another principle that we should always uh, operate by is be a channel of God's grace. And this story, if we were to read later on when they went to to, to rescue, to get back their families and, and, and their stuff. And they came back, and they, they, had, they came back with more stuff than was taken. And they come back. Well, what had happened is when they went to do the rescue, some guys were just too tired. And they stayed behind to, to watch whatever things they had. And, and so then when everybody came back, uh, the people that went with David, they said, well, these guys, don't, they don't get anything. They don't get any of the booty because... You know, they don't deserve it because they didn't go with us. And David was like, no, no, no. They, they, they washed their stuff. We're all part of the same team. No, they're going to get some of it too. So he, so he was a channel of God's grace to those people. You know, and there's a couple of truths I take away from this too. Something we need to remember. We don't always have to be able to see God's hand for us to know that it's there. Because the Bible tells us that it is there. And, you know, we don't always have to understand 
how something is for our good in order for it to be so. An, another example in the Old Testament is Elijah. Elijah was one of the strongest, greatest men to ever serve God. The prophet Elijah at one time was gripped by discouragement and despair. He had just, on one occasion, he had just confronted the, the prophets and the, and the priests of Baal at Mount, Mount Carmel, and, and, and he proved that the Lord was the only true and living God. And that was really great. Um, but I want us to read more about that in 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 18. 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 18. And I want you to follow along here and see what happens to Elijah. 1 Kings 19, 1 to 18. Now Ahab, he was a king, told Jezebel, the queen, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword, the prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And wow, that was some powerful energy bars there. <laughs> 40 days. You know, I didn't need Red Bull or any of those energy drinks. That was incredible. It says, Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, that's interesting, he hears the gentle blowing, uh, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I have been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I think I already heard that before, right? And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mehulah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. This shall come about. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha will put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So, so Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, here's what happens to all these, uh, these uh, prophets and priests of Baal and Asherah, and, and she gets really mad, and she sends out a messenger to Elijah telling him, you know what? What you did to those prophets and everything, that's child's play compared to what I'm going to do to you. Um, so she threatens his life, so he fled for his life. And when he went to Beersheba, 
You know, he left a servant there, probably not to, so he wouldn't put him at risk anymore. And then he traveled another day into the desert, and eventually he sat down under a broom tree or a juniper tree. And I uh, was reading that some of them get up to be like 10 feet tall, so it probably gave him some decent shade. You know, he's sitting and resting under the branches of that juniper tree, and he starts to pray, and he says, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. So he told God, he reached his end. You know, he'd had enough. He asked the Lord to just let him die. Now, why would he pray that way, you know? I believe there are at least three reasons. One is exhaustion, you know? Uh, that's important to remember. Sometimes it's just plain exhaustion. Uh, he was physically and mentally exhausted. He was disappointed and discouraged that the king's heart and the people's hearts were hard. And he felt as though he'd failed in his ministry, that he'd achieved no more than his ancestors had, and that was almost nothing. So, consequently, the Lord might as well just take his life. He had no more value on this earth. Another reason is loneliness. He said in verse 10, I only am left. I could tell you a lot of stories about loneliness in my own personal life. You know, when I was a kid, living away from my parents for long periods of time, and um, what kept me going was really knowing that God was with me. It was a very lonely time. Very sad time. When I was a young adult, there had a period of time where uh, my engagement was broken off and my family moved away to different places and I was in another state living among strangers. And I had to ask myself, now what? Now what do I do? I'm all by myself. On the Library of Congress, I was reading that there used to be this little blue box in this small closet that held like the library's rarities. And the label on the box said, contents of the president's pockets on the night of April 14, 1865. Well, that was the fateful night that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. There were five things in that box, and among those five things was a collection of some old and worn newspaper clippings. And those clippings all had to do with great deeds of Abraham Lincoln. And one of those was actually a report of a speech that a British statesman named John Bright gave. And in that speech, he said that Abraham Lincoln is, quote, one of the greatest men of all times. Now, history has proven that John Bright was right in his assessment of Lincoln. But, you know, at that time in 1865, there were likely millions who had a different opinion. The President Lincoln's critics were fierce, and there were many, even within his own administration. So his was a, a lonely agony where he's reflecting on the suffering and the turmoil of his country being ripped to shreds, and, you know, there's hatred and cruelty and the high cost of war. And so, you know, that brings us a, a mental picture. There he is in the Oval Office at, under the light of a candle or a, or a lamp, seeking solace, seeking self-assurance from these old newspaper clippings as he reads them. Even our Lord Jesus, you know, he wanted some company when he was in his most difficult time. He asked his disciples, remain here and keep watch with me. And uh, many times when I've, I've read that, I always thought it was kind of more like a command, you know. He was demanding that they do this or saying, you need to do this, but I'm wondering if it wasn't more of a request. Hey, guys, can you, can you stay with me, you know? Can you keep watch with me? Discouragement. He was, Elijah was physically drained. He's mentally exhausted. He was spiritually drained. Even, you know, he had had that victory at Mark Carmel, but spiritually it wore him out. He was running for his life. His circumstances were not the best at that moment. Um, one of the hardest feelings for a person to deal with is discouragement. And discouragement can be real, it can be imagined, it can be exaggerated. It can be in our eyes alone, in our own personal opinion and assessment, or it can be the eyes of, in the eyes of many. Either way, it's a crushing blow to a person's sense of worth. A sense of having failed can lead someone to despair. 
It can lead to them to discouragement. It can cause them to sink into depression. It can even lead them to contemplate and carry out suicide. I was uh, thinking about working in the ministry and in missions, and I was reading about Haggai, or Haggai, um, and how God encourages his discouraged servants. We don't have time to read all of that, but I got from that passage, you know, God understands and he cares about the discouragement that we face when we're in his service. Um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking about missions, uh, the loss of initial excitement, it can discourage you, you know. You're all fired up at the beginning, but then it starts to kind of fade, and, and then that discourages you. Uh, delays. Carol and I know a lot about delays. Delays can discourage you. Outside opposition and criticism can discourage us. Inside pessimism, comparisons, faulty expectations, they discourage us. A view, a wrong view of success can discourage us. But like Elijah, if we turn to the Lord in that time of need, God will hear our cry and he will meet our need. Let's talk about God's provision. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So Elijah had experienced both victory and defeat as God's prophet. You know, and his life, his task was too heavy to bear. So he turned to the Lord, and the Lord met him right where he was at, took care of his every need. The Lord provided um, for his need in that crisis. And if we pray, just like Elijah did, he will meet our need. He'll provide for us and when we're exhausted, when we're lonely, when we're discouraged. George Mueller, some of you might have heard of him. He built orphanages in, in England back in the 1800s. And he always did without a salary. He relied on, only on God to supply the food and, and the money and everything for those hundreds of homeless children. He had a motto over his desk for a long time, and it said, it matters to him about you. And that kind of captures the meaning of 1 Peter 5, 7, which says, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. So God met Elijah where he was and ministered to him, to his physical needs, to his spiritual needs. And, you know, Elijah had prayed that God would let him die. But aren't you glad that God doesn't always answer our prayer, or at least what we ask for? So God ministered to Elijah's spiritual need. And, you know, his discouragement was blinding him to the truth of God's presence and his power to deliver him and his people. God once again confirmed his call to Elijah's prophetic ministry. He renewed the call. He gave him a new mission. He assured him that others would finish what he had started. That was really significant for me. And working in, in, in the mission, on the mission field and working in ministry, there's a lot of times where you think, wow, what if, what if we have to leave the field? Or what if we get sick? What if we die? What's going to happen? Uh, and I often wonder about veteran missionaries. You know, are they reflecting back and thinking, wow, did, it, did I really make a difference? Well, what happened to all that stuff that we started or we were working at? It's probably just ended, you know? But God knows our hearts, and, and he assured Elijah, you know what? There's going to be, a, I've got other, other people. They're in line. They're going to finish what you started, so don't worry about it. And so that assures me that whatever we're doing on the mission field, God's got other people that are going to come behind us, and that's encouraging. And he told Elijah he was not alone. He was not alone in his desire to serve the Lord. I've got a whole bunch of other people. They have that same desire. So don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. So encouragement can come from God. Now if we go to the New Testament, uh, Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, which that's our kind of our theme passage Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25 says, 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The world is hard, especially for Christians. Elijah, Jonah, Job, they were suicidal at one point or another. And Paul and Jeremiah and Jesus himself, they had to deal with sorrow. But the sorrow was because of watching people destroy themselves, watching people reject God, watching people reject his truth. That can be very discouraging. We all need encouragement. You know, and it can actually change the course of a person's day, their week, their month, a year, or their entire life. In the first service, I didn't tell them this story, but my dad was telling me about when he was in seminary, one of his buddies from seminary, it was his turn to go and preach at the local church. And he came up to the front, he got up there, and he looked at everybody, and all of a sudden... He just went running right down the aisle, out the door, out to his car, and left. <laughs> Later on, when they asked him, well, what happened? He said he went up there, and he looked at everybody, and his mind was a blank. But, you know, some very wise deacons and elders said, we need to go and talk to him. And they went, and they told him, hey, man, it happens to all of us. Don't let that get you down. We know that the Lord has called you to, to ministry don't be discouraged. We want you to come back later. And uh, so he eventually went on to be a, a great pastor. So we all need encouragement. Proverbs 18.21 says in the NIV, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. If you think about it, the people who influence you the most are the people that believe in you the most, who encourage you. I think of Joe and Olga Kribner. Olga is now with the Lord. But her excitement about missions and how she would encourage us, and then Joe would encourage us. So every time we would come to Faith Community Church, it was so encouraging. I would be on the mission field thinking, you know, that just encourages me that they're so excited about missions and doing God's work. Another thing that I've, I've noticed is correction it can do a lot, but encouragement does even more. And we, in the jungle, we say, there's better and there's more better. And you know what? Encouragement is more better sometimes than correction. Hebrews 3.13 commands us to encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. And here the word encourage is in the present tense. It indicates a habit or way of life. It's also in the active voice. It means we don't wait for others to encourage us. We take the initiative. And, you know, if we read Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13, again, it says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day. Later on, it says, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. When a person is discouraged and we fail to encourage that person, sin can come and deceive and harden that person's heart to the point where it becomes sinful and they become unbelieving. And that person can be led to turn his or her back on God and the things of God. Someone wrote one time, people live by encouragement. Without it, they die slowly, sadly, bitterly. Now going back to Hebrews 10, our passage there in Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This is very important. We never should lose grip of what we believe. And that, that holding fast, that gripping, in Spanish there's one word that we use, aferrar. The word for steel is fierro. They kind of have the same root. So I think of holding on to it like steel holds on to something. 
We need to profess privately, publicly, what we believe, that we believe that Jesus is God's unique son. He died on the cross for our sin. He received the punishment that we deserved. He purchased our pardon from sin, from hell, by his shed blood. And he rose again, conquering sin, conquering death, conquering the grave. And he ascended back into heaven, and he's going to return. He's going to come again for his own. And if you're here today and you've never placed your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, for the assurance of your eternal future, if you've never placed your trust in him as your Savior, I encourage you to do that this morning. As best you know how, talk to God, tell him that you recognize that. You recognize your sin. You recognize that you need him. And you recognize that all of this is true. But we need to always hold on to what we know is true, what we believe. And God is faithful. And he's faithful to his promises. Encourage one another. Verse 24 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider one another means to observe attentively or understand, fix one's eyes or mind on. So we're to focus on encouraging one another. It has to, it's not accidental. It has to be intentional, which is one of the bu buzzwords today. But it does need to be intentional. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Finally, one, one of the most important things is assemble together. That's what it says, verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There was an article that I read that likened the Christian without a church to the following things. A student without a school. A citizen who won't vote. A soldier without an army. A seaman without a ship. A child without a family. A drummer without a band. A honeybee without a hive. A ball player without a team. A scientist who does not share his findings with his colleagues. Remember, Seven days without church makes one week. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Um, I was reading about the chief of radiology at the National Institute of Health, and, and they received a new cyclotron. It's used in the processing of making these radioactive isotopes that are used in diagnostic scanning equipment and radiation therapy. But, you know, some of those elements have a very short half-life of radioactivity, and they, must, they have to be used within a few minutes of their production. So the cyclotron and the patient have to be in close proximity to one another. And we Christians are short-lived radioactive isotopes, short-life radioactive isotopes. We have a very short half-life. We need to recognize that. You get us away from worship of God with other saints and our radioactivity dissipates very quickly and we lose our effectiveness. We, 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 we lose our effective radiance. So instead of forsaking worship, let us instead encourage one another. So encouragement can come from others. First of all, let me mention that we can be discouraged by others, too. We've had some times, they're not there on the mission field now, where we've been discouraged by our own missionary colleagues, by stuff that they've said to us and about us. So discouragement can come from others, but encouragement can come from others. And, and we can encourage with our words, our actions, and our prayers. Let me tell you about Javier and Fernando, two brothers blind from birth down there in Iquitos. And I can't tell you how many times there were times where I was getting pretty down, going to sleep, tears in my eyes, lump in my throat, discouraged, wake up the next morning and realize nothing's changed, it's still the same, and all of a sudden the phone rings. And it's Javier or Fernando or both of them. Hey, Brother Andrew! 
It's us. What's going on? We're, we've been praying for you. What's happening? Is there something we can pray about? Uh, how's your wife? How's the kids? How's it going with this thing or that thing? Just encourage me like that. I mean, and these guys are blind. I, I visit them in their house, you know, and one time it was a rainstorm, and, and it, there was just like the roof was leaking, and I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. These guys, they're blind, and yet they're thinking about me, how they're going to encourage me. Their, their sweet mom passed away recently, so it finally gave me the opportunity to encourage them. They were devastated. And um, so, yeah, I returned the favor and encouraged them. I can tell you about how many believing women have encouraged Carol, sometimes uh, younger than us, how they've encouraged her. Hey, don't worry. You know, you're worried about your Spanish. We'll help you. It's all good. Uh, they'll come over and help with projects, you know, when things seem to be overwhelming. Encouraged us. I've had to attend a lot of funerals, especially this last term. It's incredible how many funerals I've had to go to, and sometimes I've been asked to speak at those funerals. Sometimes we've helped with expenses and planning those funerals. But sometimes, you know what? I've just been there. Sometimes 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock. I've just been there. Just, I was just present to encourage and support the people just with my presence. Because that will encourage. That can encourage. Just be there. Be alongside them. This past week, a group of folks, as was already mentioned, they went up to the Baltimore Rescue Mission, and they did a whole lot of hard work. And it was extremely encouraging to the people there, especially the leadership, even bringing them to tears, tears of joy, tears of gratitude. We've had groups like from Faith Community Church come down, like they came down last summer, and they encouraged us. They encouraged our kids. They encouraged the believers there with all the stuff that they did. Uh, I never forget when our home experienced all kinds of damage, and three churches from the area came together um, to help us, to help us fix it up so we could sell it. We were absolutely devastated emotionally, financially, and it lifted our spirits from a real emotional and physical sickness. We were literally physically sick. We would not believe it. But that encouraged us. And sometimes encouragement even comes through financial help. I, we've had situations where we had no money. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do now? And then at the last moment, somebody came through with some financial relief. And I can't really adequately express how encouraging it is to find out that people have been praying for us. Wow. Is encouragement important? No. It's critical. It's critical. And it's awesome. So now, let's get to the, the final part. Are you a parakeet, a buzzard, or a goose? Okay, and my apologies to all any of you ornithologists out there, but this is what I, I gathered from the Internet. I like parakeets and parrots. They're like my second, maybe third favorite animal. I like the donkey the best. But I love to hear them fly over our yard there in Peru in the morning the flock going by, and, or uh, I'll be out on the river on a river trip, and I'll see them and hear them fly across the river, and, and, uh, and sometimes I'll be on the soccer field, and then they'll be going by. But, you know, when they, they fly together, it seems to me they do a lot of trash talking, <laughs> you know? It's like they're complaining or they're talking to themselves. Or they're like, you're ugly, or get back in line, or, you know, hurry up, get the lead out, you know? They just go on and on, and they're, like, criticizing each other or, and uh, it's amazing. If I could speak parakeet, maybe it would clear up a lot of things. But, you know, that, it, it says here uh, on the Internet, it says, the proper term for a group of parrots is a pandemonium. Well, they got that right. And then we have a lot of buzzards in Iquitos, a lot. And they hang around each other, you know. They, they kind of fly around together. But they all seem to be, like, looking out for themselves, really. They don't say much. They don't do much. They dry out their feathers at the same time. But they don't help each other necessarily. They'll even eat a, a fellow dead buzzard, you know, if they're hungry enough. So it seems like they're just waiting around for things to die, you know. And, and then it's kind of like, well, you know, that's life. I might as well take advantage of it. 
So they, they, they move in, they swoop in, you know. That's what a buzzard is. A group of vultures is called a kettle, committee, or wake. I had to read this book one time called Death by Committee. Yeah. Um, but, you know, are, 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 we, are we like the vulture? Are we like the buzzard? And then there's the geese. Uh, for my job before I was a missionary, uh, I had to read this book. And in this book, this Native American guy talked about the way of the gander or the way of the goose. And, and he explained that, you know, when we see those geese flying and in that V and they're honking away, they're not complaining. They're not talking to themselves. They're encouraging each other. Especially they're encouraging the one who's flying up there in the point position of that V formation. And, you know... Uh, it says a group of geese flying in the air is called a skein or skein or a team. I like that. They're a team. Uh, yeah, if they're on the water, it's called a plump. I don't know if you understand that. But, but we can learn a lot from geese about this encouraging thing. You know, when the goose flaps its wings, it creates this uplift. And it says that when they're in the V formation, I was, I was studying about this, the whole flock has 71% greater flying range than if each one flew by itself. And, you know, when, when we're people and we share a common direction, a sense of community, we can get to where we're going a whole lot quicker and easier if we're traveling on the thrust of each other, one another. When a goose falls out of formation, immediately feels the drag and the resistance because they're flying alone. So they get back into formation, and all of a sudden, they take advantage of that lifting power of the, of the group, of the bird in front of it. And we had, if we had sense like the goose, we would stay in formation with all those that are headed where we want to go. Um, if we're willing to accept their help, and we're willing to give our help to others. When the goose, when the lead goose that's up there gets tired, he falls back into the formation, and another goose goes up, I don't know if you noticed that, and they take the point position. So it pays to take turns doing the hard things and, and, and sharing leadership. And just like with the geese, people are inter they're interdependent on each other's skills and capabilities and unique arrangements of gifts, talents, resources. You know, and like we said, geese that are flying in formation, they're honking to encourage each other. They're honking to those up front to keep up their speed. Come on, man, we can do it. We know you can do it. Let's keep going. So what's another lesson we can learn from that? We, we need to make sure that our honking is encouraging. Because, you know, in groups where there's a lot of encouragement, the production is much greater. When a goose gets sick, wounded, shot down, two geese leave the formation and they follow it to the ground. And they wait for it to either die or, or recuperate. And then they, they either form their new formation or they go and join the other group. They catch up to the other group. And if we had as much sense as the geese, we stand by, be, beside each other in difficult times. And we stand beside each other when we're strong together. So we can learn a lot from God's creation. The church it needs to fly in a spiritual V formation, honking one another in steadfastness. I think that it would be at least 71% easier to live a faithful Christian life if we're flying with the flock instead of trying to go it alone. Please, I urge you, brothers and sisters, encourage one another. Encourage one another. Let me close with this passage from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed 
in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for speaking to us through your word. And Lord, help us to all understand the importance of encouragement, to receive encouragement from you and from others, and to become givers of encouragement to others. Help us, Lord, in our Christian walk and to be able to develop the gift of encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen.